Welcome to the Digital Agency Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Englander. Hey, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Dan. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So so we just got done talking and, and you're based in Austin, which is a city that seems to be exploding with life these days and with, with agencies and with people doing interesting things. Right. Um, and I'd love to start out by just le- learning a little bit more about your background. Kind of, wh- Where did you start out? How did you come to forming an agency and getting into this, this life of ours? I sort of took a non-traditional route <laughs> to building an agency. I was uh, living in New York City and I was kind of working for a lot of different um, consulting type firms where I, my target audiences were advertising agencies, design firms, and branding firms. And um, uh, it was always in the creative field. And I ended up getting my degree at NYU in organizational behavior and communication. So I, I studied graphic design, but then I was like, ah, uh, this isn't what I want to major in. So the combination of all of that and with my experience with working with creative type agencies, led me to an opportunity where one of the branding firms just wanted to hire me and uh, build up a division that was largely centered around creating a brand culture, which involved strategy, some design, but really looking at how do you take a brand and build a culture around that brand. And that sort of snowballed to getting recruited at some of the other branding firms, uh, ended up working for the top global branding firm at the time in New York. Uh, and Worked with a lot of Fortune 500 type companies, multinational companies, worked with some of the smartest and the brightest in the industry. Um, but then I went through, I don't know, I just felt like, a, you know, just to, just to give a little context uh, and then get to how I started my agency. But I remember sitting in front of the global HR director, wondering why was I getting passed up for a position in my career? <clears throat> you know, I'm smart, I'm committed, I'm dedicated. And uh, I was in my 30s at the time. And she said, well, you don't have enough gray hair, meaning I didn't look old enough. (laughs) And I was like, wow, you're in human resources and you're telling me that I don't look old enough. So it was in that moment that I knew perception was everything, right? And so that I would have a sort of a gray ceiling, if you will, in this company. And so I I left that, ended up working for a couple other firms and then went through some personal life-changing events that led me to kind of take a step back and say, you know what, I'm really sort of exhausted working with some of these big firms. And I wanted to work, create my own agency that was impacting the small to mid-sized business uh, market, um, mainly for because I wanted to do something that was meaningful and brands that were making an impact, but also um, the speed in which decisions are made, the speed of implementation was really important to me. So that led me to start my own agency called Branding for the People. Yeah, that's great. And how many how many years has it been now, by the way, since you've had your agency? Yeah, so we officially launched January 2011. So I guess we're what on our 10th, 11th, 10th year, 11th year, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And, and what was that jumping off point like for you? Like, how did you go about, you know, getting those first few clients and so on? Yeah, uh, it, that's an interesting question, because I took about six months off after leaving the whole corporate world mainly at that time, again, to just heal what I was dealing with personally, but also I was doing lots of reading and journaling and meditating. And I started going to events, um, entrepreneurial type of events. And in that whole process, sort of it just hit me of like, wow, I think I should just start my own. Now, I had no contacts. Most of my contacts were in the corporate space, right? So I was like, all right, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And so <clears throat> I knew a lot of people. Uh, and it just so happened to be that I just started to attract. I knew a lot of people in New York. I just started to just talk with people. And you're like, hey, here's what I'm up to now. And I started to notice that a lot of these uh, individuals and, and entrepreneurs and startups, they sucked at branding. And they, I was like, do you know that that's horrible branding? <laughs> do you know that that, you know, and then I just, they started to hire me. And so what I did was I piloted. I took on three clients at a very, very, like, it's not what I charge today. And I said, here's the deal. Let me deliver some value for you. uh, And I'm going to charge you this price, which is not what I will be charging in the future. But what I'm looking for is an opportunity to show my value and garner a testimonial. And so that's how it started. I had three to five clients and then it started to grow. And then I was like, well, Um, the, the last thing I want to say inside of this question, because I'm sure you have a following question is, 
I decided to do this on a, a, on a bigger scale rather than just one-to-one -one all the time. And so I was in New York City, I rented out a loft and I put 56 people in the room. I put on a one day branding event to teach and inspire and educate this audience about branding. And it was from that event that I did my, that I upsold people into my services. And that's when I did my first six figures um, on the path of replacing my income working for uh, the big firms, right? So, um, so that's how it kind of snowballed. And then I just sort of rinsed and repeat and started doing events. And then I started getting invited to speak at events, um, thousands and thousands of people, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So what what did it take to to put on this first event? Like, how did you set it up? And is that something you've done before? Or was that completely new for you? No. So in terms of, uh, I'm not sure if like you or your audience might be familiar with uh, books like Traction or Rocket Fuel or anything like that. But, you know, I'm a I'm a true visionary, <laughs> you know, and at the time, probably less so today, but at the time I was definitely more of a hustler. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to make this happen. I'm going to, I'm a creator I'm a visionary. And so I never did it before, but you and I both know it's not really necessarily knowing the how it's first making the decision that you're going to do something. And then you get organized around figuring out the how. Uh, so what I did was I sort of enrolled people in my vision. I, um, I created a model where I had sponsors for my event. I had someone completely sponsor the catering. And I said, all right, you have a startup catering business. I'm going to help put you on the map because I'm going to put X number of people in the room. They're going to get exposed to your services. In exchange for that sponsorship, I'm looking for you to just cater the, all the, the meal for the day. Then I enrolled an event planner who wanted a startup, who wanted to start an event planning business. And I said, OK. You handle the logistics. I'm going to give you an opportunity to 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 event plan my my one day event. Um, in exchange, you're going to be sort of the lead sponsor. And then she ended up end up hiring me to help her with her branding. So I got to tell you, dude, it was mo it was really just figuring it out based on the vision and getting people excited about my vision and my idea. And then I just ended up talking. Like then I had to fill the room, right? So. Uh, I created a whole brand experience because I'm a branding guy. So I had to, I branded the entire event. Um, it cost me some money, right? But um, but and then I charged people a ticket to come to my event, which helped basically cover the costs. Now at the time, this is like what ten years ago, I was asking people to come to my one one day event, mind you, for like a hundred seventy nine dollars, which I don't know. People were like, "You're crazy. No one knows who you are." <laughs> I was like, "Are you kidding me?" my hourly rate is more than that at these big firms. Cause I was coming out of the corporate mentality. It was like, my hourly rate is higher than that. And you have to spend a whole day with me and I'm going to feed them and I'm going to teach them. So um, anyway, that, that's what I did right or wrong. It worked for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's bold. And it sounds like it paid off really well. And uh, one thing you mentioned that's, that's interesting. You said, you know, you used to be a hustler to kind of build this business and less so now. So I'd love to hear, how has your your day to day evolved? You know, what do you what do you focus your time on now as an agency owner versus what have you gotten off your plate? Yeah, so the transition for me started three about three to four years into my business, where I realized that I, my name was on every part of the organizational chart, and so I was basically building a practice, not a business. And so when I started to shift my mindset around, around building a business and starting populating that organizational chart with different people then I started to seeing a pathway that, that, that I can actually grow a scale and without getting burnt out. And so if you look at my time today, I am the acting CEO and the president of the company. Uh, so I run the agency. My team does the strategy, uh, the creative, the websites, all the downstream um, client services, the fulfillment. And in addition to that, uh, I think for every small agency, the CEO is still going to handle high-level sales. So I do high-level sales. Um, I, have a, I have a handful of clients that I am actively involved in, uh, and that's by choice, right? Like uh, there, sometimes I'm in a season where I'm not taking on any clients, but I'm selective with the clients that where it takes up my private time. 
and um, I also wrote a book and I speak. So, and I do interviews like this. <laughs> so that's really where my time is being spent is really more the visionary type of activities. And then there's the boring pieces of it, like looking at the numbers and <laughs> Yeah, the, right. But that's that stuff matters too, for sure. And uh, well, and it's it's great because I think one of the one of the most common pieces of feedback we hear is the sort of like, "Hey, I'm stuck in this cobbler's children mode." You know, we're embarrassed that we do such great work for our clients, but not for ourselves. So it sounds like you're you're you know uh, taking your own medicine and so on and getting getting out there and everything. Um, so with that, I'd love to just dig into to that a little bit more. Like, what what were the some of those first roles that you hired? And if you could go back and do it again, is there anything you would do differently? Would you say, hey, I wish I had hired this, this type of person first instead of that type of person or anything like that? Uh, it was a range. So if I just really go back to that time frame, um, I thought what I needed to hire and what I did hire were uh, like a virtual assistant, handled mm -hmm. like a lot of the daily minutia. Um, I hired, I had at the time I had subcontractors or contractors to fulfill on the creative aspect because in as much as I'm, I'm, a, I'm more of a strategist, a brand strategist. And so I can oversee creative, but I'm not the one that's going to go into the computer and do sketches and all that sort of stuff. So I contracted designers, uh, and yeah, m mostly like administrative help. And the, the other thing I should say is that they were contract and they were early stage in their careers. So that, that translated to that they, they, um, they were hungry <laughs> to get the work and they were excited about the vision. They were more aligned about you know, having the opportunity to work alongside me. If I were to go back and do it, 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 this is always hard to say because it's like, I feel like every little step that I've made taught me something about growing an agency. And so I had I not gone through this experience, I would not have learned. But um, if I do look from the perspective of what did I learn and what would I do differently? I would actually hire uh, to delegate responsibilities, not tasks. And that's what I was doing before. I was basically delegating a task but not a responsibility. And so that is becomes that becomes a shift of building a business. So now I have people that are responsible for business development, you know, client services, <laughs> you know, creative, copy, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's that's really key. Um, to dig into one of those sections, the the business development section, which is what, what we focus on, you know, we're focusing on top of funnel for agencies and helping them get meetings and stuff. And then I found that that's one of the most challenging, but also lucrative things for an agency leader to get off of, of his or her plate. So I'd love to, to dig into that a little bit more. Um, you know, how have you gone about that? Did you hire somebody to handle sales? Like what, what roles, what's, what does that team look like now? Uh, well, the timing of that, this, uh, you're asking the question and, uh, and, um, I don't know, it might change by the time this actually airs. But as of last Friday, I sort of lost my um, business development person. Um, this person had to sort of deal with COVID, um, getting sick from that. So it was a sudden sort of uh, departure. <laughs> um, however, we have systems in place and we have a really good, uh, we have some funnels going and then we also have a great referral base and brand partnership program where we acquire leads that way. Um, so right now, you asked me the question, I'm kind of back in the seat of doing the sales. Um, but also, um, our agency is not a volume agency. So we have some long term clients uh, that we work with um, as sort of our base. And then we have openings for to bring on a few new clients at a time. Yeah, that's and that, it's it's hard to entirely ever leave it in my experience the the new business seat you know right. as as the owner but there's there's a lot you can get off your plate um and how much is so one one thing that was interesting is you talked about your foundation with with events and you know winning winning a lot of clients in an event scenario which is a really great way to do it has that tradition carried out throughout the years have you you know kind of kept up that event based approach or and how how has that evolved. <clears throat> Um, it's trickled down or tapered down, excuse me, is a more appropriate word. It's tapered down over the past two years. Uh, not necessarily because of COVID. It was actually a year before 
uh, COVID started that I actually decided to pull back on my speaking engagement and take time to write the book. So, um, so I, I wrote my first book and, um, and I had to do that because I was on the road at least two or three times a month. I had no time to write a book and I was speaking. And then every time I speak, we get lots of leads. So it's kind of tapered off over the past couple of years, um, by choice. And, um, but I will tell you this, the ROI and all the speaking that I've done continues to pay off. So there's the initial, like when you're, if you speak and you're good and you deliver a ton of value and your presentation, people remember you. And so we always, we just have people that, that even just as soon as, um, what is it, Tuesday, as soon as last week, heard me speak in an event in Canada three years ago that's like, hey, we're ready for branding. So we still get an ROI on that activity. Um, you know, so if you're thinking about doing, you know, if you're listening in and you're thinking about doing more speaking, like invest the time if you're willing to be a road warrior. Um, and if you're in front of the right people, uh, they'll remember you and you deliver value, they'll remember you and they'll come back to you when they're ready. They might not be ready for you right away, but it's about building your audience, your community, your followers. Yeah, th that makes sense. Um, and I guess one question is how how transferable do you think that is? Because it sounds like you've, you've ramped up other new business people in the past. We had this sort of HubSpot model that was sort of arguing that, hey, new business people should be creating content and all this sort of thing. But I've always found that it's really hard to find that skill set. It's, it's hard to find somebody that can close deals and also create good content and be the face of the company and do all these things. So I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on that. You know, could you get somebody else to sort of slot into this thought leadership position if you had to? To do content development? Um, I, I personally would keep those separate. Uh, but again, I haven't been convinced otherwise or seen a model where it does work, uh, where they coexist in terms of content development or um, or speaking and also doing the business development and the sales side of things. The reason why we keep that separate is because sometimes someone might be a great salesperson, but not a great speaker. And uh, so it, I guess it really depends is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but I, I personally, I guess in my experience, because I'm the founder and because uh, I humbly say like, I'm really comfortable, like that's my, you know, I'm really comfortable on a stage. Uh, that's my zone of, uh, of excellence, my zone of genius. Um, I'm also really good at sales. I never thought I'd be, but I'm also really good at sales because to me, sales is really just inspiring people about a vision and seeing that you can help them. You know, I'm talking about like sales with integrity, not, not just slimy sales, right? And I'm sure you teach a lot of this stuff too. Sure. Um, but a... Um, but I think if that's my role, then my job from a marketing perspective, so it's like basically separating marketing and sales is like the company does the marketing and whatever works, works for marketing. And then you want to funnel enough leads for the salesperson to then triage, you know, close and all that sort of jazz. Yeah, which which is in our experience the a healthy mindset. You know, it's it's about division of duties and not having a load wolf that has to go do do everything. Right. Just like you have a division of duties in, in any fulfillment process. Um, to shift gears a little bit, uh, you wrote a book. I, I've also written a couple. You know, and I, I'm about twenty thousand words into a nice. first draft of, of of another one about new business. And I haven't written. I kind of used you know self publishing to launch Sales Schema, and now it's been years, and I've learned a lot in this process and finally ready to launch another one. So nice. selfishly, partially for myself, but also for anybody else and the other agency owners out there that are thinking about doing this, what, what should you keep in mind? What should you expect if you're going into this process of, of writing a book? <laughs> what should you keep in mind? Uh, well, the first thing is that no one makes money off of books. <laughs> so um, for most agency owners, if you are going to write a book, it is basically a marketing tool to then, it's on the back end, basically. You make money on the back end. You don't make money on actually selling books. Uh, at least I haven't seen that from a lot of people that I know. It's, it's really, it's a credibility play. It is a marketing tool. It's a door opener. Um, and so um, now that being said, I don't wanna rule out the possibility that someone makes a ton of money off of books, right? If you're self-publishing particularly but I think the first thing to keep in mind is you have to get clear on what do you want this book to do for you and your business. 
And so most people don't clarify what that is. They just think, oh, I should write a book. But why do you want to write the book? And what, what are, how would you measure success um, in that book? Two, um, a book is meant to capture a mo your thinking. It, it's meant to capture your thinking in a moment of time. So when I started writing the book, it was sort of like I was kind of getting caught up in perfectionist syndrome and was like, oh, well, you know, the, we want to write a case study, but this case study is not done yet because we're still working on this brand and yada, yada, yada. And so uh, I ended up using case studies that were complete, even though I may not be working with them anymore, but it, doc it documents the time. You can always do an abridged version. You can always do a, a, a book number two, like you're doing, right? So sometimes you may have multiple books in you. And so just think about getting your first book done, getting it out there. Um, I think the third thing too is, I'll offer up this for everyone because there's a lot of crappy books out there. I would say, do you wanna have a book that, the question you wanna ask yourself is, do you want to have a book that, to, to sell a lot of books or do you wanna have a book that impacts the people who are actually going to read it? So there's a lot of, even the whole New York Times bestseller and Wall Street Journal, that's a game in and of itself. And you can certainly play that game. And I'm sure it's, you know, for some people, that's their goal. That's what they want to achieve. And there's nothing wrong with that goal. Just know that that is a goal in and of itself. And it's about volume. It's about selling number of books. It isn't necessarily leading with getting the books in front of the right people who are meant to read your book and you are meant to impact. So if you want to have a book that is meant to impact your niche or your target audience, write that book for them and and focus on that that doesn't mean to say you can't sell a lot of books and do marketing but lead from that that would that would be my suggestion if you will <laughs> yeah that that was that was so great and, and helpful and i think that it's it's funny because i've gone back through my old books and i'm like oh, i don't even really think that anymore i'm not happy with how i expressed this here yeah. and then over time like i think one of my friends kind of put this out the right way which is that if you're if you don't feel like that then that either means you have a lot of hubris or you you haven't evolved at all right so exactly. it's like it's healthy to have that that sort of feeling exactly, um yeah. that's that's great and to, to get a little bit little bit of tactical uh how do you suggest kind of getting these getting this book out there and, and launching it and marketing it i think i've always struggled between you want you know a certain amount of um premium and credibility on the book and selling it like any others. On the other hand, I want to get it in as many hands as possible. You know, like you, sometimes you see free giveaways of book with paying for shipping or whatever. So uh, tactically, is there anything that you found to work really well for kind of balancing those things? If that makes any sense. Um, well, any kind of response I'd say, whoever's listening in, I think you have to look things in context. It really goes, I'm a strategist at heart. So it really kind of depends on what you're trying to do strategically um, that informs what you do tactically. So my experience is only based on one experience, one book, um, and maybe just peripherally what I've seen for, for other, you know, entrepreneurs and, and influencers that I know. Uh, but if you start with the premise that if you start with the couple of premises, one being, uh, this is going to sound really harsh, no one really cares about your book. <laughs> uh, two, like even getting people to write like blurbs for your book or whatever, like it, it's, it's, really, it, it's a process just to get people to help contribute because they're, no one really cares about your book. Um, and then two, uh, a lot of people don't have time to read all the books that they want to read. And I forget the exact numbers, but most people would actually prefer an audio book. <laughs> so, um, and, and then the other third premise, which I mentioned earlier, is that no one really makes money off of selling books. So if you just have those things running in the background, I think um, what there is to sort of look at is, okay, write a book that um, that is going to get in that that's going to hit all the bases of like, I don't know, Amazon bestseller or whatever like that, but it's going to give the book into the hands of the people that you were meant to sell it to. So for example, for me, we did a pre-order phase blasting to our community. I got, um, people who were in the book 
I got some other influencers to promote the book. And what we did was rather than giving the book away for a dollar, we asked people to buy X number of books and in exchange they would get these types of bonuses. So that was a strategy that I used. So you're constantly developing value. That's just one idea. I know some people who market a book and it's free uh, or it's whatever, they just pay for shipping, but then there's like an upsell, which is a course, a $500, $497 course, right? Um, and then there's uh, other strategies where, you know, people, um, they don't really care about selling the actual physical book. They just want people to buy the ebook so they can get a certain whatever status. So, you know, there's, I'm trying to answer your question, but I just want to let you yeah. know there's different tactics depending on the strategy. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's super useful. And the, the idea is that it's, it's a marketing tool. <laughs> and uh, I, I, in the early days before I knew anything, I didn't learn that lesson, but I think now that's kind of, that was the early days of self-publishing. So I think a lot of people didn't either. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, that's good to know. Um, and to finally kind of move into to what you're actually doing, um, I, I, I love the, the cover and the name of your book because it's such a great old school pattern interrupt and it's, it's called your brand should be gay. So I'm sorry to make you have to sum everything up, but what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> no, it's a common question I get now, but in all fairness, so the, there's a, there's a, there's a second part to that. So it's your brand should be gay in parentheses, even if you're not. And so um, it, it's exactly what you said, you know, it's a pattern interrupt, but I'm actually teaching the power of branding through my book title. I personally wanted to do a book that sort of stood out, that was different than all the other branding books that are, are out there. And so the book cover, if you look it up on Amazon, right? It's a pink color book. How many pink cover books do you see? And then you have this big bold text on there that says your brand should be gay even if you're not. And so it's the response that I want is exactly what you just said. Well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Right, so it piques curiosity. <clears throat> Branding should be uh, should create an uh, an emotion. Right, you're either going to be you're going to have a laugh about it, you're going to be uh, inspired by it, you might even be pissed off or offended by it. Um, so it elicits an emotion, and then um, a, a strong brand is um, polarizing, and so you're going to have people who are going to become raving fans of the book, and then you're going to have people who are going to be uh, turned off by the book that you're like, ah, you know, they, and it's, what's interesting secondarily, I also know that branding and language really can create a perception of people's minds. And it's really open to their interpretation because what if I meant your brand, uh, should be happy, right? <laughs> There's okay. a couple of different ways I can interpret it. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, so I'm just, based, I'm teaching through the, uh, the power of branding of, of having a brand that's bold and provocative. Now, it just so happens to be that I identify as a gay man. And I, it's not something I really wear on my sleeve all the time. It's not like I'm in a closet, but it's not something I wear on the sleeve all the time, but the book really is about authenticity. And so if for people who listen to me or follow me, if they didn't know that I was gay, well, guess what? Now they know. And I, I actually could care less whether or not someone is, uh, accepts me uh, for that identifier or not, because me being authentic and me being who I am, and this is my message for other people who, you know, as a brand, whether you're a personal brand or a business brand, own who you are unapologetically and not be afraid to piss off a couple of people or to offend people because those people you weren't meant to work with. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's really important. Um, and kind of bringing this, you know, towards, towards the end of our time, I'd love to just learn, you know, what, what are you working on now? Like as, as the, the, the founder and owner, um, where are you putting your energy? Like what's, what's exciting you, what's getting you up in the morning? Um, yeah. So where I, I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard this term, uh, from Dan Sullivan, but it's like, you're either a simplifier or multiplier, but, uh, so I'm a, I'm a multiplier. <laughs> so so I have the agency, but then I also have a couple of things um, building out. Like I do these um, high-end personal branding retreats for like some high-level clients. And then I'm also building out a branding certification program to help and certify other marketers, coaches, consultants, branders around building a brand and, and their strategic process so that they can elevate their game and help them grow. So those are the things that kind of excite me in terms of our impact and, and, and what we're doing in the world. So it's more than just agency work. And 
And I think that's the other thing too, to help other, the other agency owners listening is having a diverse uh, revenue stream um, is really key to really creating a, if that's what you want, right? But having a diverse revenue stream so that you're not always reliant on um, clients. Yeah, and that's that's something that we're working on and thinking about a lot too. And I almost I always think of this something I read and it was in it was in a health book of some sort. It was talking about how they used to think of calories as being all created equal. If you got calories from potato chips, calories from broccoli, they're the same. Over time, they realized that's that's BS, and the, where the calories come from matters. Obviously, calories and vegetables are going to be better than potato chips. I think the revenue is a little bit like that sometimes, you know. So your service is great, you know, like uh, it, it fuels everything else. I found you, you know, it's often the best starting place. It doesn't just go away, but you got to start adding other things. So that's right. That's, that's right. where we're at as well. So that's, that's great to hear. Um, Ray, thank you so much for your time. And how can people follow what you're up to and get in touch and all those good things? Yeah, I guess the two main things are just uh, everything is all on brandingforthepeople.com. Uh, so it's branding for F-O-R, the people.com. And, um, and then there's my book, yourbrandshouldbegay.com. Awesome. We'll get that linked up and uh, hopefully get you back on before long. So appreciate it, Ray. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day. Thanks, sir. Day too.